Hello, my name is Dr. Lucinda Harris. And I have been asked to talk to you today about motility disorders of the small bowel. I would like to thank the IFSGD for the opportunity to do this talk for you and tell you a little bit more about motility disorders of the small bowel. So what is the small intestine? Well, it's kind of a misnomer to call it small because it's really not so small. It's about 20 feet long. And this is the small intestine right here. It's called the small intestine because of its cross-sectional area. And it consists of three areas, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And I'm calling it the middle child because it's located between the stomach and the large intestine. One of the things to be aware of from a functional point of view or mechanical point of view is that if there are problems in the stomach or in the colon, the small bowel may be affected as well. It's also the place where digestion and absorption of your food take place. So it moves and absorbs. That's its kind of primary thing. And it's composed of the enteric nervous system. There are over 600 million neurons that are located in both the lining and the smooth muscle of the GI tract. It's been called the second brain because it can operate independently of both the central and peripheral nervous system. And as I said before, what it does is digest and mix the food and absorb nutrients. How it does that is by various cells that are located in the lining of the small intestine, and it depends on something called peristalsis. And peristalsis means that there are waves of coordinated contractions and relaxation that move the food through the GI tract. There's also a little pacemaker within the lining of the small intestine called the migrating motor complex. And it's very important because it helps sweep the food and nutrients through the gut. There's also other wiring. So you think of the enteric nervous system as the nervous system that innervates or works in the lining of the small intestine, but there's a control system often called the autonomic nervous system that, think that consists of sympathetic um, input from the vagus nerve and parasympathetic nerves, which are the splanchnic nerves. So what is a small bowel motility disorder? What do we mean when we say that? Well, it can be a problem with muscles and or nerves that control the movement in the small bowel. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a picture of the inside of the small intestine. The whole group of disorders is also, it's often called chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction. And by that, it, it, it meant that the intestine behaves as if there is a blockage, but there actually is no blockage in the intestine. And there are primary and secondary causes of this disorder. So primary chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction is the type of pseudoobstruction that occurs mostly because of genetic disorders. So there are, are familial visceral neuropathies from this familial visceral myopathies and types that occur sporadically. And there's also something called a mesenchymopathy, uh, where there are defects in pacemaker cells called interstitial cells of Cajal. So these are primarily the genetic disorders and they can occur in families and they can have different types of transmission. Now they are extremely rare and they estimate that only a hundred cases per year occur. There are also secondary causes of uh, pseudo obstruction and these make up about 60% of the small bowel dysmotility disorders. These can occur because of infection, like viral infections. Chagas disease is a disease that occurs in South America due to a parasite known as Trypanosoma cruzi. 
There can also, and probably this is the most in common type of pseudo obstruction, it occurs because of connective tissue disorders like lupus and scleroderma. There are also autoimmune causes that occur because of diseases like myasthenia gravis that can have endocrine causes. Another not uncommon cause is uh, cancer. There can be what they call perineoplastic syndromes. That means syndromes that are associated with someone having cancer that slows down the motility. There also can be pseudo obstruction due to drugs, and the most common medication that causes that is usually the narcotic medications that people take for uh, pain syndromes, but also some of the uh, medicines that people use for Parkinson's disease, the L-DOPA uh, medications can cause that. And there can be miscellaneous causes. Another a uh, fairly common cause of pseudo obstruction can be radiation and even ehlers stanlos which is a uh, defect in the connective tissue, uh, which can take many forms and has been coming to um, um, more popular discussion lately, can cause pseudo obstruction. Well, what are the symptoms? Um, that depends a lot on the part of the GI tract that's most effective. It's important to know that men and women are probably fairly equally affected. The disorder can be sort of like chronic low grade symptoms of nausea and abdominal discomfort, but oftentimes people may have what we call acute attacks. And these acute attacks consist of nausea, vomiting, severe abdominal pain that can be very sharp in nature. It is often also associated with bloating and constipation is very common. Patients also will complain of feeling full fast, that's called early satiety, loss of appetite, and there often is weight loss. One of the complications that, very, that is very common in small bowel disorders is that patients can get what's called bacterial overgrowth, and that can cause diarrhea. So usually the small bowel doesn't have a lot of bacteria in it, but because the uh, intestinal motility is not working to sweep out the bacteria, patients get diarrhea. And bacterial overgrowth is covered in other educational um, videos. So I will refer you to that because that would be a whole lecture within itself. Other common symptoms are difficulty swallowing, heartburn, chest pain, and the disorder can affect the urinary symptoms, of the urinary tract, so patients have symptoms uh, emptying their bladder or getting urine started. How do we uh, diagnose uh, uh, chronic intestinal tube obstruction? Well, there can be blood tests that look for inflammation and autoimmune markers. I've already shown you a plain X-ray, but we can also use barium and CT scans and MRIs. Endoscopy can help us rule out that there's no mechanical obstruction. There's a test called manometry, which is a flexible tube that's inserted in the GI tract, either into the esophagus or the rectum that can take pressure measurements that can suggest this disorder. We also, and you can see it pictured here, have wireless motility capsules that people swallow, and we can tell and track this capsule and tell and look at how fast the gut is moving. We can also do that with another X-ray mo modality called nuclear medicine studies, where the patients eat a meal that's nuclear tagged, and you can tag how long it takes for food to go through the GI tract. We also use breath testing uh, for diagnosing the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There's another modality called radio radio opaque marker studies, which are little markers that people swallow, and we take serial x-rays to tell how quickly those markers are moving through the um, GI tract. Very rarely, we also can do full thickness small bowel biopsies that can look at the cells and see where the defects are more completely. To manage chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction is to really do supportive care. So most of the 
symptoms result in problems with nutrition. And so certain diets are recommended. There can also be drugs used and the drugs that we most commonly use are called prokinetics. And um, they, we use antibiotics to treat bacterial overgrowth. Uh, we can use pain management, but we try to avoid narcotics because of the fact that they slow down the gut. If there's a cancer, we treat the underlying cause. We also have to pay attention to lifestyle. There can be complementary medications and visceral massage that helps. And in very small, very small number of cases, we can use intestinal transplant. In the next two slides, I cover some of the medications that are commonly used to treat back uh, to to treat um, intestinal motility. Um, they oftentimes are not indicated uh, as to, as medications specifically for the disorder. For instance, brucalipride is actually improved to treat chronic constipation. There are really no medicines that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration to treat this disorder. We also use a medications called anticholinesterase medications, primarily pyridostigmine, which you can titrate up in small amounts. And you can see that a lot of the medications have um, a lot of side effects. For instance, pyridostigmine, because it works on muscle receptors, can cause diarrhea and also muscle twitching. Uh, just a moment to discuss small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The small bowel in good health only contains a small amount of bacteria. Um, there are, can be a variety of antibiotics that are used. The important point here is that probiotics are not helpful, but promotility agents may help to sweep some of the bacteria out of the gut. So, in summary, chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction is a very rare disorder divided into primary and secondary uh, types. The problem is either in the muscles or the nerves of the small intestine or both. It has both chronic and acute symptoms, acute symptoms most often being nausea, vomiting, abdominal swelling and pain and weight loss. The treatment is mostly supportive. And certainly as my dog Danny demonstrates, food is very important to us. And it really is an impetus for us to seek more treatments and research is desperately needed in this area, even though these disorders are rare. Thank you for your attention.